Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started here. and uh, We really appreciate all the support uh, of faculty and staff coming for uh, our medical students. The, um, uh, we have, a, we have a three students, one from the University of Utah, and then two away students who are uh, presenting this morning. And I'm really grateful to have these medical students with us. I think they really do add a, um, a unique element to just our training environment and the educational experience here at, at the Moran. And we're really grateful to have them. They've, they've done a wonderful job so far. Um, first, we'll hear from Annie Shepard, a child with no red reflex uh, and a case of Coates disease. Uh, after, after that, you, you know, I'll, I'll let you read the time. We, we're, here, we're here from Spencer Fuller, who's from UC San Diego, uh, and he has a really interesting research case uh, uh, of a video recording from the perspective of the patient in cataract surgery. Uh, and then Brian Kirk uh, from uh, uh, University of Utah is going to be presenting, on, presenting to us of uh, the patient experience during sequential bilateral cataract surgery. So, so some really interesting topics, and I'll turn the time over to Annie. Thanks, Annie. Hi, I am Annie Shepard. I am from the University of Tennessee, and I will be going over um, a case of Coates disease this morning. I have no financial disclosures. So this is a case of a six-year-old. Oh, why is this? Change it to present. Where is that? Maybe display settings. There we go. Um, so this is a. Six-year-old male with a past medical history of sickle cell trait. He was referred to ophthalmology from a local optometrist for what mom described as decreasing vision from the right. He didn't repa report any pain or photophobia. Um, it was a slow, gradual onset, and mom also noticed that his eyes looked different in pictures, much like this image seen here. He has no past ocular history and is not currently on any medications. Uh, on ocular exam, he had an absent by uh, red reflex on the right and a slightly diminished one on the left. Visual acuity on the right was count fingers at two feet and was 20-25 on the left. Uh, vitreous showed some cell or pigment bilaterally in the anterior vitreous. And dilated exam showed exudative lesions in the foveal region on the right and sclerotic vessels with peripheral exudates bilaterally more so on the right than the left, and sacular dilation of vessels bilaterally. Uh, retinal imaging of the right seen here, there is a large exudate in the foveal region. Uh, it was described on exam as being raised, but you can't really appreciate that on just a photograph. There's um, also peripheral exudate, so you can see kind of um, outside of the margin of this photograph. And then <coughs> on the left, uh, there's also Exudates, no foveal involvement on the, in this eye. Um, and you can see the vessels are overlaying, overlying the exudate, which means it's deep, either intraretinal or subretinal. Uh, imaging was ordered on this patient. Um, an MRI was done to rule out retinoblastoma. It showed no calcification, which was a good sign to rule out retinoblastoma. Um, but the image did show bands in the orbits bilaterally. Uh, which was called either fibrous or inflammatory changes. A fluorescent angiogram was also done. This showed light bulb dilation of the capillaries, and the peripheral retina um, showed areas of non-perfusion, and there was exudation in the posterior pole involving the macula on the right, which correlated with the um, fundus exam. This is an MRI not of this patient, but of a classic unilateral Coates disease. You see a smaller orbit on the right, that is hypodense with, um, you can kind of appreciate some hyperdense banding in the orbit, and there's no extra ocular pathology seen. This is a fluorescent angiogram. You see a large area of um, non-perfusion with these dilation of the vessels, and on the bottom of the fluorescent angiogram, you see a very torturous dilated vessel and those uh, light bulb dilation in the top. So Coates disease uh, is also known as exudative retinitis. It was first uh, described by Dr. George Coates in 1908. It's most commonly seen in young males ages six to eight, um, but it has been described in patients as young as six months old and as old as 71. 
there's no racial or ethnic predilection. And usually it's unilateral, but can be seen bilaterally. If there's more going on than just the Coates disease in a bilateral, in a patient with bilateral disease, it would be warranted to do a genetic workup. Um, Coates disease has been associated with, this is three syndromes, but there has been multiple genetic syndromes that have been associated. Um, the pathophysiology behind Coates disease is idiopathic vascular malformations, um, which creates fragile vessels with a thin endothelium. Um, this endothelium leads to leakage of intravascular contents and uh, the buildup of exudates in the retina. <coughs> The, the exudates are usually cholesterol and lipids, and this leads to the formation of ghost cells. Uh, they're commonly described as being yellow-white in nature and are beneath the, post, beneath the retinal vessels like we saw in the fundus uh, image. The vascular hallmarks seen are telangiectasia, aneurysmal vessel dilation, and capillary microaneurysms. The normal presentation, like I said, was in a preschool age child uh, that has strabismus or leukocoria. They can also be caught, um, like the patient that we went over, having a decreased vision on screening. A rare presentation, um, usually seen late in the disease, is a cholesterol bulbi, uh, which is seen in this image here, just a buildup of cholesterol um, deposits in the eye. And if a B scan is done of this, you'll see a snow globe effect. The vitreous becomes much more liquefied, and the cholesterol seems to circle inside of the inside the globe. Older children and adults, although rare, uh, can present with decreased vision, usually due to macular pathology or retinal detachment. Complications, like I said, are retinal detachment. Um, these are exudative retinal detachments, uh, glaucoma, often neovascular glaucoma, and physicist bulbi. The differential is pretty broad, but can include um, retinoblastoma persistent fetal vasculature, and pars planitis, plus these other ones listed. Management of Coates disease is mostly um, centered around retinal detachment, with 65% of patients developing a retinal detachment over five years. Uh, current treatment regimens include cryotherapy and photocoagulation or some combination, but there have been new studies over the past 10 to 15 years looking at anti-VEGF injections as possible um, additional treatment. Uh, most patients uh, have effective treatment if there is early ablation of these abnormal vasculatures, and that is because there's obviously less exudates if you catch it early and fewer poles involved. So the it, new studies on anti-VEGF injections, this first study, they found that patients with Coates disease had increased VEGF levels in the vitreous. And their thought behind this was uh, retinal detachment leads to um, retinal hypoxia, which subsequently leads to the release of VEGF. And unregulated VEGF, as we know, leads to vascular malformations, including telangiectasia, microvascular occlusions, and microvascular aneurysms. And all of these are weak vessels and, le and are leaky and lead to exudate buildup. So this first study looked at a two-year-old boy with Coates disease that was complicated by retinal detachments um, that were refractory to surgery. He underwent two rounds of uh, intravitreal injections, which are eight weeks apart, and he had complete reattachment and stability six months, at six months follow-up. And then the second study looked at uh, three patients that had both laser ablative surgery and injections. And all three patients had complete reabsorption of subretinal fluid, and they recommend that these anti-VEGF injections could be a good additional therapy um, with the classic laser therapy as well. Uh, this last study is from May of this past year, and it had a larger patient population of 16 patients that were given intravitreal injections. They made the comment that exudations, including the in the macular area, led to uh, less vision improvement than if the macula was not involved. Um, and they also noted that patients with the more severe retinal attachment had a more um, robust reaction to the uh, injections. Uh, this is just a pathology slide of a total retinal attachment 
um, with subretinal fluid, you can see, um, you can appreciate some of the cholesterol clefts, and then at a higher magnification, these clefts become very obvious, and also the appearance of ghost cells, um, which, are which are filled with cholesterol and lipids. This is a cholesterol crystal that was, um, that was obtained from subretinal fluid in a patient with Coats disease. Uh, this is, it's common to find this in the subretinal fluid, but it can also be found in the anterior chamber of these patients as well. Um, so just to wrap up, the, we'll go back to the patient uh, presented at the beginning. He underwent five rounds of argon laser treatment in both eyes over five months, and nine months after his initial presentation, his vision in the right had improved to 2400, but like that study said, he had macular involvement, so he was unlikely to have dramatic vision improvement. And then on the left, it stayed stable at 2025. And you can appreciate the improvement of the exudates in both eyes, and, but there's still a pretty large macular involvement on that right eye. Um, I'd like to thank these individuals in particular and also everyone for listening. Are there any questions?